Hi, this is Dr. Joby. Welcome to the podcast. This week we'll be looking at the individual psychology of Alfred Adler. This is a simulcasted lecture that I'm delivering at a university in Pennsylvania. I hope you enjoy it. The individual psychology of Alfred Adler is the first of the psychodynamic theories of personality uh, that we refer to as ego psychology. And uh, this is a distinction that's quite different from the id psychology, id-based psychology of Freud. Freud focused on unconscious motivations and on biological drives, the id and the unconscious. Uh, Jung um, focused on the unconscious in a different way than Freud, but Adler really was focusing on the ego. Uh, We might even think of Alfred Adler as um, one of the first psychodynamic theorists that approached what we uh, refer to as existential phenomenological psychology, also known as humanism. There are a few concepts that Alfred Adler introduced into the psychodynamic conversation. I'd like to um, present uh, some of those ideas to you and then spend the next few lectures unpacking those ideas. Uh, Maybe first and foremost, uh, along with the ego psychology or the concentration on um, on decision making and thinking, on consciousness, on the ego, on the self, uh, is the understanding of the importance of social interactions. Uh, for for Adler, um, this was really uh, the greater pressure on individuals was not necessarily uh, the biological drives that Freud spoke of were the unconscious biological drives. But for Adler, uh, it was really social structures that put the greatest pressure on the individual. Now, this is an idea that would really be developed later by Eric Fromm, Uh, the idea that social social pressures, uh, politics, economics, uh, media, uh, social interactions, all had a greater influence on individuals than the biological drives did. Uh, So Adler was really one of the first to, if not the first, to introduce this this idea into the psychodynamic literature. Along with ego psychology, um, we have concepts of inferiority and how we come to deal with inferiority. Uh, Birth order was an important uh, aspect of Adler's theory. Uh, what Adler referred to as style of life, uh, which is what we today call personality, uh, can also be called uh, character style. Uh, so the style of life is some an aspect uh, that was later developed by other theorists that Adler introduced into the dyna- psychodynamic literature. The importance of social interest, uh, the importance and a very unique and today very useful and relevant uh, system of dream analysis that differed uh, from other uh, uh, approaches to dream analysis in psychodynamic theory, and also the importance of earliest recollections, understanding how we can use our earliest childhood memories to understand uh, our own style of life better. So these are all important concepts that we will unpack now over the next uh, series of lectures. Alfred Adler was born in 1870 in Vienna, Austria, went to the same schools, the same medical school as uh, Sigmund Freud. They did know each other briefly for about nine years um, and uh, were friends, um, but uh, did did have a bit of a falling out and um, were not very fond of one another uh, after that nine-year association. Uh, Adler... uh, born in 1870. He died in 1937 in New York City. In fact, he moved to New York City in 1929. Alfred Adler had a childhood that was marked by physical fragility and um, and death. Um, Adler had a a bone deficiency, I'm sorry, a vitamin D deficiency in his his earliest childhood that weakened his bones. And uh, at the age of four, he was so close to death that uh, from pneumonia that he actually heard the doctor uh, tell the father that uh, the boy that he was that he was about to die, and this is when Adler 
uh, developed his desire to become a physician himself. Adler lived through the death of his younger brother. When he was three years old, his younger brother passed away. And he always had a sense of, uh, of, of, of inferiority to his older brother. So we have uh, some of the main central themes uh, of Adler's theory appearing in his youngest years. That is inferiority, fragility, death, and how one uh, comes to deal with those feelings of vulnerability. Adler was not a great student in school, and um, his, his teachers actually advised um, his father that, uh, that Adler apprenticed as a shoemaker. These all contributed to Adler's uh, fear of inferiority, biological, physical inferiority with his bone maladies, um, his performance in school, which is social inferiority, and this uh, Adler saw as something that he wanted to overcome, and uh, he wanted to uh, shape his own life rather than have his destiny be shaped by his biology, his physical um, attributes, or by society. And this is really at the heart and the core of Adler's ego psychology. This is uh, an individual who uh, placed the importance on shaping one's own life conscience, consciously, one's own decisions of who one wants to be, and developing one's own self in that way. And this is where we really see uh, a connection with the existential psychologists and the humanists. After moving to the United States and settling in New York City, Alfred Adler became one of America's foremost psychologists, uh, writing in books and magazine articles on psychology. Uh, some of his, uh, his theory had, has made it into uh, common everyday usage. And let me tell you some of these words, inferiority complex, compensation, overcompensation, and inferiority complex. These are all terms that originated with Alfred Adler and are specific to his theory of personality. Let's uh, take a let's unpack this now. Um, f starting with feelings of inferiority, Adler uh, proposed that we all uh, have feelings of inferiority. That at the core of all of us is a, a sense of vulnerability. Um, this is, stems and originates from our earliest years when we are born as uh, atricious beings that need our parents' uh, care in order for our survival, and Adler felt that this remained part of us. Um, Adler felt that at the core of all human personality was a sense of inferiority in some way. Um, we had some, um, some aspect of ourselves that we felt inferior to. Early on in Adler's theory, he felt that it was primarily physical inferiority, which he referred to as organic inferiority. So for example, if an individual had poor eyesight, the, if the eyes were, were, uh, were inferior, the eye organs were inferior, uh, an individual would uh, seek out danger uh, in the environment and would develop a personality that was preoccupied with um, protecting oneself. This is one of his earliest theories of organic inferiority. Uh, but he then uh, expanded this into a general sense of inferiority, a general sense of um, as always uh, having a sense of inferiority to others and even to one's own ideal self. And so for Adler, the question to ask when looking at personality or looking at why someone is doing something is asking the question about the motivating force. How is this compensating in some way for a sense of inferiority? Now this term inferiority is very important because it uh, it points towards something that Eric Erickson will later talk about and other theorists and that is autonomy. So we have what is autonomy and volition is self-directedness, the ability to uh, direct one's own behavior and stand on one's own two feet. Uh, so these terms volition and autonomy uh, are very closely related to uh, Adler's motivating force, ultimate motivating force of inferiority feelings. So the question we always ask at the core of anyone's behavior 
anyone's feelings, anyone's actions, and the collection of those that we call their style of being, their character style, or their personality, as we would say today, is a reaction to feelings of inferiority. The term that Adler used to describe our motivation towards overcoming either real or imagined or perceived uh, inferiority was uh, is compensation. Compensation is a motivation to overcome uh, a real or perceived imagined uh, inferiority of some sort, and this is the driving force of personality. Now, Adler found that most of his patients um, came, came to him with complaints of chronic feelings of inferiority, and he referred to this as the inferiority complex. And an inferiority complex is a condition uh, that develops when a person is unable to compensate for normal inferiority feelings. So all of us, according to Adler, have a sense of inferiority, but some of us have a, a d defined sensitivity to that, um, to that uh, inferiority and have trouble dealing with uh, compensating for that inferiority, and that is what he found many of his patients dealing with. Um, Adler pointed towards three sources of, um, of inferiority complex, and that is the inability for an individual to deal with the human condition of a sense of inferiority. And he said that these three, uh, these three uh, sources originated mostly in childhood, and the first one we talked about is organic inferiority, that is some sort of uh, physical inferiority to others. Another is spoiling. Individuals who are spoiled by their parents uh, tend to have difficulties dealing with their sense of inferiority. And neglect. Individuals who are neglected by their parents uh, have a difficulty managing, self-regulating their sense of inferiority. Concerning organic inferiority, we have multiple and very common examples of individuals who have suffered some sort of physical uh, inferiority as a child, uh, being scrawny or maybe being a late bloomer, and then going on through overcompensation uh, to uh, become star athletes, award-winning winning Olympians, etc., uh, and this is quite a common story uh, about those who, of those who, who overcompensate, deal with their inferiority complex through um, an exaggerated sense of, of that in, of reaction to that, that sense of inferiority. Uh, one question that uh, I had read uh, put forth by Adler in one of his writings is that one should ask themselves, uh, what it is they they feel uh, inferior to in life? What they do they feel least capable of doing? And understand what they've chosen as their profession in relation to that. It was uh, the idea that we choose to do that which we feel least capable of doing in an effort to overcompensate. So we see overcompensation in uh, in many uh, aspects of um, of of overachievers, of people who achieve great things, the people we admire and, and uh, people who inspire us by their extraordinary achievements, we often see that in this an overcompensation for a, a sense or perceived sense of inferiority. It's also important to realize that this says something about narcissism. Um, individuals who are narcissistic uh, we might ref refer to this as a superiority complex. This is what Adler called the superiority complex. Uh, someone who d uh, can develops a, a, w a, a way of being, a strategy of character, strategy uh, to deal with, um, in an extreme way, of internal feelings of inferiority. So this is an individual who uh, feels the need not only to convince others, but to convince themselves that they are not inferior. And this would be a superiority complex. Uh, this, this is exaggerated opinion of one's self and one's abilities. Now these individuals might be overachievers. They might be very successful individuals or they can be actually uh, not so successful and maybe even underachievers. 
But what's important here is that they have a perceived sense of superiority as an external kind of character armoring or a way of being that helps them to overcome and deal with a very painful sense of inferiority uh, inside of them. So how does uh, an inferiority complex result from uh, spoiling or pampering? Uh, this is interesting. This is uh, the idea that a parent dotes on the child and, and makes them feel very worthwhile and very uh, maybe even superior to others because they're the center of attention. Uh, but what happens here in spoiling, Adler said, is that the parent uh, does not prepare the child to manage their own frustrations. So in spoiling, the child never learns how to self-regulate, how to rely on themselves to manage their sense of inferiority. And it's uh, always been... Um, something that has been done externally. Then the child goes to school, and for the first time, they feel that they are not the focus of attention, they're not uh, special in any way, and they don't uh, understand how to generate their own sense of internal uh, uniqueness and specialness because they have come to rely on an external validation system. And this is how spoiling or pampering can lead to an inferiority complex simply because the child never learned the skills to self-regulate. Uh, neglect, of course, uh, is the opposite. Neglect is the opposite extreme. Uh, neglect is when an individual, when a parent uh, does not uh, treat the child as being worthwhile or special in any way and the child does not develop their own sense of, of worthwhileness and mirrors how the parents treat them. And this is also, um, for Adler, a source of the inferiority complex. So as in all of psychodynamic thinking, we're not really looking at a cause and effect relationship here. We don't have the situation that, uh, that uh, you know, nurturing causes uh, a, a solid sense of self in childhood. What we have is a matter of extremes, extreme neglect and extreme spoiling uh, manifest in an inability for one to self-regulate and to manage their own sense of inferiority feelings. So we're always looking at extremes rather than a direct one way or another cause and effect relationship. Now Adler discussed this idea of a striving for superiority and he said this is our urge towards perfection and completion that's in within each of us. And the idea is that um, perfection or the superiority is not necessarily to be better than others, but it's a sense um, in its original use of the word perfection, superiority, wholeness, and completion. It's um, not cause and effect. It's not being pushed from behind. It's being pulled towards. It's, it's referred to as teleology in Aristotelian philosophy, the philosophy of Aristotle. Teleology is the idea that we are being tor pulled towards some ultimate um, fictional finalism, as Adler called it, uh, an idea that there is an imagined or potential goal that guides our behavior. So uh, for a cause and effect um, thinker, uh, someone who's m more interested in scientific approaches uh, to psychology, um, the idea is what causes one to go to college? What, is the, what are the causing factors to go to college? Um, and for Adler, this is not the question to be asking. Adler sees um, pooling factors. What are the pooling factors? And that would be each one of us entering into college, not because someone caused us, a parent told us to go, or, or something caused us to go to college, but that we imagine an, a, a, an ultimate self, an ideal self, maybe. Um, and this fictional finalism, this ultimate ideal self that we have in mind, uh, pulls us. It's a goal that's pulling us towards that goal. And each of us are working towards um, becoming that, um, that, that superior or that whole or completed self that's in, within each of us. And for Adler, that was something unique in, in each of us that we also contributed to forming who this f fictional final uh, self is. So we want to think more of wholeness and, co and, and completion when we're thinking about strivings for superiority. And we also want to think about how this theological pool uh, guides our lives. Now, Adler said that we can actually have a sense of inferiority to ourselves. If, um, 
an individual is not working towards their fictional finalism, towards what they believe their ultimate uh, whole self could be, one could get a sense of inferiority to their, their own potential. Uh, it's in the act of working towards what one thinks one can be that these strivings for wholeness, or as it's uh, written in Adlerian terms, striveness for superiority manifests. So this is these this is uh, really uh, where um, the idea of a style of life originates. How, what is the characteristic style that each of us takes? Uh, towards striving for superiority, striving towards our whole complete self. And this is, this style of being is, is the personality for Adler. Many of these guiding forces um, that shape our character style or our, our, our style of being is our style of life is uh, belief, is based on belief. And for Adler, it wasn't so important what uh, what is. What's important for Adler is what one believes in. Uh, if one believes in certain things, that will become the guiding um, structure for one's style of being, uh, the style of life. So for Adler, belief is really the guiding force of personality and of course, belief is something that we, uh, in our ego, can consciously choose to believe or not believe in something. Um, f this is part of Adler's psychotherapy, um, was coming into contact with what, what the structures of one's own beliefs about existence and life and meaningfulness um, are, which, uh, which then comes to shape their style of living. Um, an individual can change their 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 beliefs and uh, can question their beliefs, um, and this is not necessarily big question always big question existential beliefs about uh, like kind of faith beliefs or spiritual beliefs, but beliefs about themselves, beliefs about others. Um, we can have a general belief that the world is a good place or, or a helpful place. Uh, or people are ultimately good. We can have beliefs that people are ultimately self-serving and negative, and based on that ultimate belief, um, we will we will that will come to shape our entire character style, our ent entire approach to life, and how we approach others, which then folds back and becomes our reality. Now, this is an idea that's going to be taken up by uh, future theorists, including Karen Hornay and Eric Erickson. These basic structures of belief and how they um, shape who we are in our style of living, our character style. So now that we've looked at ideas of inferiority and compensation, the inferiority complex, the superiority complex, the fictional finalism, uh, teleology, the role of striving towards wholeness or striving su towards superiority, and the concept of the style of life, uh, the character style, let's turn now to some of uh, Adler's um, uh, assessment tools, how, how Adler felt we can achieve at understanding our self and our beliefs. Hi, welcome to the Dr. Joby podcast. This is part two of lecture four on Alfred Adler's individual psychology. Alfred Adler described personality as a style of life, a characteristic strategical way of being that is crystallized by the age of four or five. Now, to, make, um, to give an example, um, the style of life is a pattern of characteristics, of behaviors, of habits, of ways of approach approaching uh, problems in life, sense of inferiority and compensation uh, that the child um, f concentrates on, learns from parents, learns from culture, learns from predispositions uh, by the age of four or five. So Adler thought that it was important for all of us to um, explore our earliest childhood memories to have a better understanding of our adult character style, our adult style of living. For example, if a child uh, has some sort of uh, physical uh, inferiority, remember we, that uh, Adler referred to this as a, an organic inferiority, uh, that child might overcompensate by 
oh, pursuing uh, excessive physical activity, lifting weights, or ex excessive uh, concentration in exercise in order to overcompensate for um, their physical uh, inferiority. And this becomes a template for attacking inferiority later in life, um, for having a sense of whom one is, their style of life later in life. A neglect neglected child, they might feel inferior in coping with the demands of life, and uh, they can become distrustful of others, maybe in resentful and hostile towards others. And this template, um, an, an individual might um, have a certain uh, style of life that is resents others who have success, um, see another's success as a sign of their own, further sign of their own failure, their own inferiority. Um, they might be have a style of life that's concentrated on seeking revenge in others and uh, even a sense of taking what is their due, uh, maybe even a, a feeling as if someone or something or a government or a system owes them something for a wrongdoing. Uh, so this is a style of being that Adler says really uh, is crystallized by about the age of five. Keep in mind that Freud, too, felt that the first five to six years of life was the essential uh, foundation of personality, uh, but Freud uh, didn't concentrate as much as Adler did on, um, on these learned strategies, on choosing how one uh, goes about dealing with their feelings of inferiority. Now, regarding the style of life, um, Adler claimed that free will was a big part of this and that we had, in fact, a creative power of the self. This is similar to the idea of the will or free will. So we were not entirely uh, d determined by our environment or our parents or our parenting style or circumstances of childhood, and we were not entirely determined by our biology, by our genetics. Uh, Adler felt that there were influences of both the environment and genetics, but ultimately it was our creative ego, our creative selves, our free will that determined our strategy of life, our life, our characteristic way of being in life. Now, he also described that there were several universal problems uh, that individuals encountered. And these were three categories that he found most of his patients presenting in his office and also three categories of problems that he felt were universal in the human experience. The first of these uh, overall groups of problems was problems involving um, our behavior towards others, um, uh, so interacting with other people, uh, problems of occupation, choosing one's occupation in life, doing one's work, and finally problems of love, of romance, of, uh, of the love relationship. So these were the three biggest um, problems that he found individuals dealing with in unique ways. He also pro proposed that there were uh, four basic styles of life for dealing with these problems, that people's personalities or their life, their style of living could be broadly categorized in four, uh, four styles. Um, he was generally opposed to any uh, rigid classification of character types. So these aren't to be taken as a, a character style or a personality style like we've seen in Jung or in Freud, uh, but these are just general descriptors. And this is uh, just to make a point uh, as we explore more of Adler, um, sometimes Adler's critics uh, treat his, his ideas of, um, of the, the four basic styles of life as well as the birth order, as a little more literal than uh, Adler proposed it. Adler, uh, in no way, shape, or form, proposed that there were that these were four personality styles. And as we're going to explore about birth order, the family constellation, he in no way claimed that you could predict personality entirely from the birth order. Uh, he used it as an interesting teaching aid, as a way to to show how families. Uh, and family structure and uh, and whatnot could be could be broadly understood in generalizations of the human experience. Um, unfortunately, people have taken this and um, and use it in a way that uh, Adler did not intend. 
let's look at these four basic styles of life. Um, he found that you could understand people as being the dominant type of a character, a getting type, an avoiding type, or a socially useful type. Uh, the one, the healthful way of being is the socially useful type. This is an individual who has empathy towards others, who is interested in building and constructing and generating towards uh, society. So for Adler, someone who possessed social interest uh, was an individual who realized their innate potential to cooperate with others and to make the world a better place for others. The other three, avoiding type, getting type, and dominant type, were actually unhealthful character structures. Um, he described the, um, the uh, dominant type as someone who liked to rule, who was, who was obsessed with power, and um, he, he felt that people who, uh, who did this had little social awareness, and they were interested in acting for themselves and dominating other people. Uh, they got a sense of security by controlling others. These are individuals who are sadists and delinquents, and Adler called sociopaths. Um, these were um, also included people who were addicts, like alcoholics and drug, a drug addicts, or even individuals who uh, attempted suicide as a gesture. Uh, these were individuals who took control of others by uh, attacking themselves. Uh, so even this form of self-punishment was a way of controlling others. And this is what uh, Adler referred to as a dominant style of life. Uh, the getting style, these are individuals who uh, were interested in taking from others. These were um, uh, coped with their strategy by um, seeing what they could get from other people. This is a, a way of um, becoming dependent on others. For example, an individual who um, takes orders or is, is submits to another, this is the, the submissive type of individual, never really has to take responsibility for their own actions. They can always say, well, they so-and-so told me to, or I was just taking orders. So this getting type, it's more of a submissive type. It's one who gets security and has a sense of safety um, at, at at submitting to others, and this is what he referred to as the getting type. It's a, it's someone who takes from others, uh, takes security from others' dominance. So we can even see the beginnings of what others, such as uh, Wilhelm Reich and some others referred to as a sadomasochistic relationship, a moral sadomasochism. That's when a dominant and, a, and the, the relationship that comes about between the dominant type and the getting type. Hadler um, didn't go into detail so much about that, but that is uh, something that's involved in other uh, theorists' writings on the sadomasochistic relationship. Um, we also have the avoiding type, and this is the individual who avoids difficulties by avoiding social makeup, uh, social uh, interaction. They do not take risks for fear of failure. This is the individual who becomes almost like a zombie. This is the living dead. This is an individual who's become a living corpse. They do not do anything because they don't. Uh, they fear failure so badly. And this is what is called the avoiding type of personality. So we see in here four broad structures of personality styles, uh, characteristic ways of being: uh, the dominant type, the getting type, the avoiding type, and Adler's um, healthful uh, category, the socially useful type. Um, socially useful type, again, is defined by empathy and service to others. Uh, Adler did point out that the majority of patients that he saw uh, fell into the getting type category. Let us turn now to Adler's discussion of the family constellation, uh, birth order, and the four uh, examples he used to illustrate how the environment could influence a child's and a, a personal, personality, their style of being. He said that there were uh, four, he described four basic situations, the first born child, the second born child, the youngest child, and the only child, and showed how these family constellations, when uh, the individual was born in relation to their siblings, or whether or not they had siblings, how this could affect personality. Uh, and style of being. Adler did not say that this was the way a child would turn out or this was uh, set in stone. He said these are merely used to illustrate um, how 
environment can affect personality. And again, I want to caution uh, the student to not get carried away with these with these examples, uh, which Adler discussed uh, for pedagogical use only. Adler said that the firstborn child, the oldest child, is in a unique position because they initially enjoy the exclusive attention and excitement of being the first child for the parents. Uh, that uh, exclusive attention, that undivided attention, is then taken away when uh, a second-born child occurs. Um, this is what is referred to as dethronement, the dethroned only child. This is an oldest child who enjoyed the exclusive love of the parents, not sharing their affection with anyone else, being the complete center of attention, and then being dethroned at a certain age um, could result in initial resentment and anger, uh, stubbornness, behavior problems, destructiveness, and things of this nature. And these firstborn, if they're punished for their troublesome behavior, Adler claimed that uh, it would be further evidence to them that they've been dethroned and it would, they would lash out even more. He described that as other um, family therapists, psychodynamic therapists, including Bruno Bettelheim, uh, described that the best way to handle this was to be give responsibility to the oldest child, uh, give them a role of parenting to the to the younger sibling. Now Adler pointed out that the age difference uh, when the second child was born could uh, definitely affect uh, how the dethronement and if the dethronement takes place. So if there's uh, say an eight year difference, if the child's eight nine years old by the time the second born is uh, is is, is enters the picture, uh, then there would be less of an impact. But if the child was younger, say maybe two years old, there would be more severe sense of dethronement and more of a reaction. So firstborns, Adler found, uh, are usually oriented towards the past. This was through uh, observation and clinical interview. Uh, uh, they're more oriented towards the past. They have a sense of nostalgia, um, and maybe even a sense of pessimism about the future. This all makes sense, the, the understanding that there's an event in their life that changes things, uh, and not for the better, perhaps, and this would mean a fear of change uh, and a certain nostalgia or looking back towards a romanticized past. So these are all templates that could be used to... Um, understanding uh, the firstborn. Uh, there were advantages to being the firstborn child. Um, as the child ages, they'd become a role model, a teacher, a tutor, a leader, um, someone who uh, could uh, set an example for the second-born child, for the younger child. Adler described that the firstborn uh, could often go on to become a very conscientious uh, leader, someone who was interested in authority, someone who was very good at organization and uh, very scrupulous and attentive to detail, um, maybe even more of an authoritarian and conservative outlook of life. Uh, so these were all characteristics of the firstborn child. The secondborn child has an interesting role. This is a child who, incidentally, Adler says, um, encounters different parents. Uh, the second baby is an, a novelty. They're not, uh, it's, it's a different uh, attitude the parents will take after the experience of the first child. Usually parents are less anxious about the second child, a little more confident about their, their child rearing practices, uh, less concerned and anxious about the um, about their behavior, the child's behavior. They're, they're typically, Adler pointed out, our parents are more relaxed with the second child. The second child doesn't understand dethronement, has never been the complete center of attention. And all of these uh, experiences, all these dynamics come to shape uh, in a completely different experience for the second born child. Um, again, this is not to be taken as written in stone or cause and effect relationship. This is to illustrate and to become sensitive towards the unique environmental situations that siblings have within their family constellation. Second-born individuals also have the pace setter and competitor of the older sibling. This is the model. Uh, this is the one they're compared to, and they can um, have a certain uh, interest in competing with the older sibling. Um, 
it's also interesting to understand that Adler noticed that second-born children didn't always experience the desire for power uh, that um, the the um, older sibling was interested in. They weren't. They were less interested in being competitive, less interested in power, and often had less ambition than the older child. Um, they often were also more optimistic than the older child. The second child might also be more vulnerable to feelings of inferiority, especially if the older sibling is an overachiever. Uh, this could um, lend the individual to be either having a sense of inferiority or a superiority complex with overcompensation. Adler pointed out that the youngest child uh, was often a pampered child, a child that was the pet of the family. And they often uh, became very successful, very achievement-oriented, and um, were, were very... Uh, uh, much the, the focus of having the benefit of three older siblings which, uh, or two older siblings, which would, in fact, give uh, extra parenting, extra resources for this young, youngest child. Again, they often become the pet of the family. They have a lot of resources, and they develop remarkably fast. And um, when they're born later, they are often high achievers in whatever they undertake as adults. Now, Adler pointed out that the opposite can occur, that the youngest children who's excessively pampered can become too reliant and, uh, and become almost like a spoiled child. Uh, and they don't rely on themselves but rely on others to, to take care of them. So this is a unique role. Usually the youngest child is, uh, is the special child of the family and of the parents. And this leaves us with one final uh, situation, that's the only child. The only child is um, not accustomed to sharing the love of the parents. They don't understand uh, the concept of sharing the love of the parents. For the only child, they are the ultimate end-all and be-all of the parents' affection. And this, uh, Adler said, creates a, an adult that can be very powerful, uh, very self motivated, very uh, self-confident, but also has difficulties in relationships with others in which they do not understand uh, the concept of having to share the affections of others. So they can also be perceived as being very demanding of others' uh, affections. Um, these individuals uh, can become very uh, powerful, uh, very self-motivated, very um, uh, very much uh, mature in, in, in relating mostly to adults and not with other children as they were growing up. Uh, they haven't really learned too well how to share or compete, so they're often not competitive, uh, not feeling the need to compete with others, and they don't feel often much of the need to share with others either because these skills were just not developed uh, in, in young uh, childhood. Um, the idea is that the, the child spent their time with adults and not with other children. Uh, the child um, is, again, um, often frustrated or disappointed when they enter into a social situation and are not treated with the same uh, attention or enthusiasm uh, that, they, uh, that they experienced growing up from their parents. Finally, let's take a look at Adler's um, use of dream analysis. Um, for, for, for Adler, the dream was not wish fulfillment. The dream was not even a guiding, uh, a guiding um, aspect of one's pursuits the way it was for Jung. Uh, for Adler, the dream was always something that the individual was dealing with in their current life situation. So when doing dream analysis, you would the, 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 the therapist would listen to the patient's dream or the patient themselves would uh, become aware of how to analyze their own dream. And whatever was happening in the dream would be taken as a symbolic uh, metaphor for whatever they are and used to point towards issues that they're dealing with in their everyday life. Adler really put forth the common use 
today the contemporary use of dream analysis for most psychotherapists. When we use in psychotherapy dreams for exploring an individual's emotional state, we are looking at the importance of emotion and we're looking at how the individual's dream correlates with their struggles or points towards some um, unfinished business that's going on in their uh, in their life. So for example, um, a dream would not uh, a dream would be symbolic about something that's going on in their current situation. So you would always listen to the dream and understand it within the context of what's going on in their life. So there were some common dream elements that uh, that Adler found uh, reoccurred in in general uh, stories of dreams in different patients, and there were some generalizations that he could point towards. For instance. Um, the idea of flying uh, was success, was feeling a sense of volition, a sense of autonomy, a sense of free will and control, whereas the sense of falling uh, was a sense of impotence, a, a sense of losing control in life. Um, an individual who was struggling to stay in flight was someone who felt that they were uh, in their everyday life accomplishing their goals and um, working towards their fictional finalism um, but was struggling to do so. Um, the fear of failure in falling, uh, the, 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 the pleasure of success in flying. Paralyzed, be a, a dream where one can't move or can't fight back, is uh, facing a problem that one doesn't know how to conquer. Um, s examinations in school and tests um, was generally found to correlate with real-life situations of lack of preparation. Um, any type of uh, rage uh, was, was present in a dream, often had a counterpart of anger and hostility in, towards someone or something in, uh, in waking life. And uh, things such as wearing the wrong clothes would, uh, be, uh, would point towards often one's self-consciousness uh, of one's own faults, of one's own shortcomings and failures. So when we look at towards dream analysis with Adler, we're not looking at the same level of symbolism that existed in either Freud or Jung. We're not looking at wish fulfillment, which what we're looking at is uh, the individual, the minds working through issues that are relevant to the individual in their waking life. Um, the idea is that they might be in an altered state, they could be in a bizarre or dreamlike uh, metaphor, but the emotional content is what matters. So if you look at what's emotionally happening in, the, happening in a dream and then relate to how that emotional content is important in the waking life, you can explore... Uh, you can use the dream to point towards unresolved issues in waking life or to be better informed about one's uh, psychic, uh, emotional uh, sense of being in their waking life. Alfred Adler's legacy uh, continues today. Uh, one can become certified as an Adlerian individual psychologist. There are Alfred Adler Institutes uh, in most major cities throughout the world. Um, one of the most popular and uh, one that Adler himself was involved in the founding of exists in New York, the Alfred Adler Institute in New York. I'm going to include that, li that link for you to explore. So Alfred Adler's therapy continues to be one of the uh, most widely used forms of therapy and self-exploration in psychology and therapeutic psychology and uh, informs uh, some of the other major theories of personality, including the work of Eric Erickson, uh, the work of Eric Fromm. Uh, even we see some interesting correlations with um, the personality theorist uh, Wilhelm Reich.